get a I was talking about what it costs to build an airplane. Like the, uh, the uh, unknowns, like for instance, the example I'm using is lumber. Like who would have thought how much lumber? Oh, we're moving that. that. Holy Perry. <laughs> oh, I had that framed up. <laughs> They're killing me. <laughs> we're approaching the final stretch of the build and I've got the crew together for an expenses recap meeting. Let me kick it off, okay, so before we get started, okay, that is basically a recap of the whole thing. Dave, there's a copy for you. This is what we spent. I couldn't believe how much money we spent. Holy hell. <laughs> I could. Of course, it is fun spending money with other people's money, I find. <laughs> Honestly, if you can't spend, I mean, I just had to throw money at the problem in a lot of ways because well, I couldn't be involved Right, that's what always. we talked about, right? It was, yeah. it was like, yes, there are ways to do it cheaper, but when you have five people waiting to do something, you just buy the little thing that you need to get it done. So I'm, I'm not regretting any slight overages. I don't think the, to the total is insane. Well, there, there's no overage as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so anyways, the way we handled the finances was that I did most of the buying, Dennis did some buying, John did some buying on specific things, but I did most of the buying. And so what I would do, I would just accumulate a list of invoices and then put them on a spreadsheet. Dave, do you want to show a spreadsheet earlier? A typical one. September 2019. So I've learned a ton being a part of this aircraft build project, and it's been a really fun process to share it via these videos. And it's almost bittersweet as we transition to the final steps and tools like the grinding wheel are getting less use. This is another episode of the Build Vlog. It's an ongoing series following our team ran by Perry as we bring a Vans Aircraft RV-14 to life. So uh, I think there was a total of seven buys. So as you can see, uh, I broke it up between facilities, tools, and supplies. Right now we're at uh, 7.4 thou. US dollars, and that has taken care of everything that we think we're gonna need. There might be some odds and sods left with the firewall forward kit, but uh, for a, a, somebody starting out right off the bat, if you planned on, let's say, eight, 9,000 bucks US, that'll, that should cover the whole ball of wax. The major suppliers were people like Aircraft Spruce, both in Canada and the United States. Pan, Pan Am Tools was, uh, was uh, pretty good. They had a lot of good stuff. Uh, we use local suppliers like uh, Lowe's and uh, Home Depot, uh, Princess Auto even. How much of this from you having done this before, like was there anything you didn't have to do in the 7? I would say it was very, very similar to the stuff that I had to buy for the 7. The only thing at the 7, I had to buy uh, a heating system for the garage. Well, we had that here, so we didn't have to do that. At home, uh, in the garage, I had to buy an air compressor. We had that here. All we had to do was buy some airlines, and then we set up some uh, air hose reels and stuff like that. Oh, I'd say a very similar set of tools, regardless of what Vans airplane you want to build. When I did the first one, the 7, I got a lot of guidance from guys who had already built similar airplanes, like Pete Marshall built the 9. He was my mentor, so I think it's a good thing to, uh, to talk to people who have already built. They'll give you guidance. And uh, in the case of EAA chapters, like, you know, that's even, that's a treasure trove. Because there you've got a, a nucleus of a lot of people who have built, and they'll help you. So it's, you're not on your own. You want to add anything, Dave, from actually having gone through the, the compiling? Like anything surprised you? Anything? I don't think anything surprised me. I mean, obviously the bulkier expenses are going to be tools and supplies. The facility stuff, some builders may not have to deal with that if they're already building other things. They might already have workbenches and, and things of that nature, but obviously we didn't. And frankly, 638 bucks US to build all these benches and things like that is a pretty reasonable cost for that. No, it's just really just, you know, tools. Tools are expensive and good tools are even more expensive. What is this saying? It's um, buy the angle grinder at Harbor Freight, but buy the, the discs at Home Depot. Right. right, right. Yeah. This, uh, this schedule of two also uh, gives you a good idea of the cash flow, right? It tells you how much money you're going to be spending by month. So there it is. You don't have to, you don't have to put 7.4, you know, all at once. So it's a, it's a progression. So there's a good cash flow statement for you. And then in terms of the 90% complete, 90% to go, is that where we're at currently? It is, yep. Yeah. The bulk of the man hours is, is, is done. Now it's the, it's the finesse part, get the engine on, firewall forward kit. We're, we're well over the hump, well over the hump, yeah. So yeah, finishing kit is, they're just, they literally just asked me for the address, so it's coming. So we're among the first to be getting the new finishing kit. A bunch of components needed to be changed to accommodate the new version of the engine that's now available. 
And the nice thing too is now Glenn's ahead of us on this piece of it, so guess guess whose brains we'll be picking. <laughs> How did he get well, it? He doesn't have an EXP 119 engine, right? No. So there are some differences. Glenn picked out some pretty cool colors for his Thunderbolt IO390, but we got the EXP 119, which is the new variant of the Thunderbolt. We've evaluated the inlet area. We've evaluated a filtered direct induction system. We've evaluated a, a crossover into a Y-style exhaust adapted for this engine geometry. What we've ended up with is a package that provides no additional complexity for the builder, some weight savings in the parts that go into it, and a significant performance increase. We caught the crew up on that awesomeness, as well as other exciting developments, like the progress we've made working with Steinair on the panel. We have a lot of help from Steinair and things like that, right? Yeah. For dropping in a panel with a wiring harness that's already made for us, that's gonna be killer. Yeah, that's yeah. Working with those guys, the I can't believe how much they've they did for us. Like uh, the and the que there's, they've done it so many times that like the the, pe the questions are so pointed. They're like, you know, this is the layout I would do. Do, do you want to change it? It's like, man, if it's worked 45 times, no, no, I don't want to change it. But it's nice that they involve you in yeah. the process in case maybe there's something oddball, weird thing you need to do. There was at no point that we ask a question that wasn't like immediately readily available to answer. Yeah. Right. We'll see more of Dave as we get into the panel and the engine install. Perry's brother John and Dennis have done a lot of the grunt work. In the context of the ancillary stuff that we've done right. to stand up a workshop, I'm really just a paper pusher. So yeah, you kept kept track of what we spent. So Dennis is mic'd up. You want to tour the stations and talk about what you built and what the tools are? Sure. In order to make a build go well, you need to, and this also gives you something to do while you're waiting for your first part of the kit to come. You need to prepare benches and things like that. And we have these uh, two benches in particular, the same size. Uh, they're made all out of uh, two by fours. We put, built shells underneath two by fours. That's a three quarter inch MDF on top, which makes a good solid surface. Oh, I can't think of what else to say. Uh, so you use it for storage, you use it for building, and it's also kind of destructible. Like we've been drilling right into it. We, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's just it'll, kind of an all purpose. Take a, take a lot of pounding, you can move them around and you can configure them in different ways. And these are only two feet wide, so out of one sheet of MDF, you get two benches, so, so it's good use of material. But you really don't want any wider. There's no advantage to wider because you, you're hanging over things and working on things. Looks like the uh, mosquito guys are borrowing it for a little bit of their stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every Saturday. Well, that's cool. I, I think mean, that people like don't, you know, I think there's this, there, they, Vans is pretty upfront about like, you need this much space to build an airplane. You know, you, you don't wrap your hand around, well, what do I need to fill that space with? It's not just I'm sprawling all my parts on the floor. Yeah. Like you need to have a way to organize it. And as soon as something, I know that for me, like on any project, as soon as it becomes disorganized, it's just abject chaos. Right. Like I want, I want to put it into the store and that's why the storage portion of these benches is like super critical. Our multi-tool workstation is probably one of my favorite parts of the hangar. And Evelyn enjoyed working here too. And uh, the bench is really only the two feet wide. We hung an extra shelf on the back that actually can fold down. And that's maybe not necessary, but this part of the bench really is critical. And on it, as you can see, we were able to get, it's both a belt sander here, a disc sander over here, the drill press in the middle, the bandsaw in this corner, and then a grinding wheel over in this corner. And these are all absolutely essential things to have. These, you need every one of these. You need every one of these. But by configuring them on here the way we did, on this little tiny top of only two feet by four feet, we've got four really useful tools. There. Three people working at this thing yeah. together at the same time. Like I got my daughter working on this thing. It was pretty cool. So then this thing evolved. So we started with that and it was just a box, but then we thought, why not put some shells inside? And now we've got storage in there. And, and again, we label, label, label. If you're working by yourself, the labeling isn't as critical, but if you're gonna work as a team the way we are, it's really important that everybody gets on the same page about where things go. A lot of guys didn't have to stand up an entire environment brand new like we did. If you're already a builder of other things or just a wrench hand, you're gonna have the drill press, you're gonna have the, all the sanders and the grinders, and, but we had to obviously acquire new, so there's yeah. financial costs involved there. And but, then this uh, is another big table. Now this bench we made wider on purpose and we put a shelf down here so we can have uh, we can have drawings in underneath and uh, and up on top and this is standard out of a, a automotive repair place 
and we organized uh, all the uh, parts the same way as vans give them to you. So down this row is all three thirty seconds. This is all one eighths. This is all number six screws, number eight screws, number ten screws. And we usually put on both the AN numbers or the AD numbers, but we also put Van's part number as well. One last thing that I would point out, and this is how like we didn't foresee any of this, but we got to where we had parts that were getting finished. So in this case, what we used was Van's shipping box. And we have finished parts all in there, protected with wrap and protected with styrofoam. But those are finished parts that are all stored in there so they don't get lost and they don't get damaged. And around here, we needed to work on the wings. And so we built these so that uh, the, the exposed area on the wing is right here. And you can easily work on them back and forth. This sort of gets invented as you go along and that's what everybody, if somebody's in a tiny little garage, they're going to have to invent whatever will work for them. And there's, not, there's not such a thing as one size fits all. Perry's brother John took us through some specific tooling and other aspects of our workshop. Yeah, so a lot of the uh, small tooling for, you know, riveting, uh, dimpling, and counter boring and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, the squeezer. We started with that. And as we went on, uh, and, and uh, you know, t as, as the word of the project caught on, you know, a lot of, there was a few people that donated uh, some tools that they had purchased for their own build, right? So we got a pneumatic squeezer. We got some more tools down here. You know, I mean, we can count all the bucking bars as tooling. They're all donated from John. Now, here's some other tooling. Now, all this was free. We didn't purchase this. You know, it was donated or borrowed. So, uh, yeah, there's a, you know, I mean, if you had to go buy this, it's, I'm sure yeah. you'd spend a few thousand dollars. I'll be paying this stuff forward to donating as needed after we're done. Tin snips, valuable, buy the good stuff. Don't buy, uh, you yeah. know, secondhand. I mean, that's a good point, right? There's so. certain tools you can get away with not being like awesome and precise, but other ones you do not want to chase yeah, out on, right? Yeah, right, yeah. On the back table here, We've got, you know, basically this is out of Perry's workshop at home. Uh, well, we, I mean, we've purchased lots of paint, uh, you know, primer, self-etching primer, all kinds of uh, different uh, grades of sandpaper, uh, you know, um, scotch, you know, scotch brake pads, and uh, lots of Clecos. All our Clecos do were donated. We got two or three big buckets of them over there. There's a number of places where we had to use some fiberglass. So, you know, West System is the preferred uh, uh, glue for that. You know, along with West System, you've got to buy the, you know, the fillers, Microlite or the uh, high density filler or the low density filler. Uh, you know, and, and this stuff is rather costly. And each one knows about $100. So, all kinds of things like, uh, I can't tell me how many rolls of Toilet paper or paper towels we've gone through, uh, Varsol, uh, brushes, you know, just just all kinds of things that aren't specified anywhere, but you know, you have to use this stuff to to, to do like anything at the workbench at home, right? Same here. Classify those things as like expendables? Like consumables. Consumables, yeah. Right? Consumables. You pay any AME, you're gonna have a line item on your invoice to shop consumables. It's yeah. gonna be rags and yeah, sure. cleaners and yeah. There was, uh, under our feet, some mats that we paid quite a bit of money for, just for general comfort too, although they are all gone too. We, we still have them. They're on the trailer. They were, most of them are on the trailer uh, for the Cornell right now. Oh, adding, I see. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 uh. Cut to shot of that craziness. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think a lot of guys that are building in a hangar that they own or a garage that they own, they're building a static workshop. Whereas ours is completely set up to be dynamic because we're not guaranteed in this hangar this particular workspace forever. Right. Like, right? We've been kind of lucky that uh, we haven't been shoved around much, and uh, we've got some urban sprawl going on here. That, <laughs> thankfully, it's going to get a little tighter when the uh, Cornell shows up because we got the Tiger Moth the wings off right now. But we can compress and expand and relocate the build area dynamically because everything here, nothing here is is anchored. Right. right. So, uh, one more table <laughs> of of parts and supplies. Um, so this is, at this stage in the project, this is all the parts we have left from vans. Which is about to change. Which is about to change, yep, very soon. Uh, and on along the back here, we took the instructions 
and divided them up into each section and put them in its, its own binder there, right? So we um, labeled them with section 36 ailerons and uh, put them back here. So uh, this is kind of like our library. Yeah. And, uh, and it worked really well, actually, yeah. There are so many ways to tackle an aircraft build project. My plan to tell the stories of other builders has been challenged due to border closures and travel restrictions. So in the meantime, I've been inviting builders to send footage, and Martin took me up on that. He's building an RV-8 and makes some pretty fun videos documenting the process too. Hello fellow builders, welcome to Useless Projects, the show that covers things that builders build that they don't need to build, but they build them anyway because they want to. One of my first useless projects was my empennage stand. The van's RV-8 empennage cannot be assembled to itself, it needs to be attached to the aft fuselage. Since I completed my empennage long before I received my fuselage, I wanted a stand that would hold the entire empennage assembly in correct relative orientation. As with most of my useless projects, it was eyeball engineered and evolved with different features as needed. It's currently holding the empennage at my hangar, waiting patiently for the rest of the airplane to get finished. We'll definitely be checking back in with Martin. And as I try to figure out how to tell other builders stories without traveling, I was happy to be invited to be part of this. What's up, Av Geeks? My name is Ryan from Super Aero Live, and I'm really excited to be hosting a round table with these four super awesome aircraft builders. Hey everybody, this is Gil from the Build Fly Go channel. You may have seen Mary and I fly our RV9A uh, across the US and to some fun, warm international destinations. We have videos about our flights, of course, and also our RV-10 build, uh, which is the other aircraft we're building right now. It's uh, currently at the fuselage phase, and we have time lapses with commentary of the entire build process. We also have videos on how-tos on basic airplane building technique, some avionics use and commentary and reviews, and really any excuse to go fly. You'll see everything from a big international trip to a trip around the local patch in the pattern to get fuel or whatnot. We look forward to hearing your questions and uh, talking to you on the Builder Roundtable. Hey everyone, I'm Christine from Plane Lady and on my YouTube and Instagram, I document as we slow build our entire RV-10. We're a little over a year into our build and we have finished the empennage kit, the wing kit, and we're into the fuselage kit. I try and document any shortcomings we might have along the way, as well as any helpful tips or tricks that we've picked up on and other really helpful things that we've learned from other builders out there. I also have videos about different air shows that we've been to, like Air Venture up in Oshkosh and things like general aviation camping, what you might expect and what you might want to bring. I really love sharing the excitement and the adventure of this whole build experience with everybody out there, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the questions that you have and doing my best to try to help answer them for you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jason Ellis, and like you, I am an aviation enthusiast that decided one day that I really wanted to fly and really wanted to own my own airplane, but didn't have the bottomless pit of wealth required to buy that high performance aircraft. So uh, I decided to go the experimental aviation route. Uh, I purchased a Vans RV-10 kit and I've been at it for five years at this point. And you know, honestly, I'm still learning new things. It's been a great journey. I've been documenting all of it on my YouTube channel. I'm trying to do so in an approachable way. I am not an expert, but rather a guy with a dream and a pile of parts and I'm always available to answer questions. And so I think this is an awesome opportunity to chat with y'all and I can't wait to see what y'all come up with. And I'm Steve from the Flight Chops channel. I've got over 200 episodes covering all sorts of different flying adventures and flight training. And recently I've started a side stream of content focusing on following the process of building a Vans aircraft RV-14 with an awesome team of guys from the Canadian Historical Aircraft Association. So I'm really looking forward to learning from the builders on this panel. It's gonna be hosted by Ryan on the Super Aero channel, so look for the link on all of our various social medias. I hope you guys check it out. In the next episode, we're back to Alaska flying real-world missions in the DHC-2 Beaver. I cannot judge distance or anything in here. We're really far from everything. Things yeah. are massive. Crazy weird. Yeah. This is a huge multi-part series. There's already several published and more to come. Thanks to sponsors and Patreon supporters for helping create this content. And until next time, Keep your flight chops sharp. 
Yeah, so I'm rolling all the cameras. So as far as I'm concerned, this is the thing. Yeah. That, well, that's one of my shots. Oh, gosh, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs>